Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start reading a little bit out of The Mythic Past by Thomas L. Thompson. Just to make a video and see if anybody watches. The Mythic Past by Thomas L. Thompson. Biblical Archaeology and the Myth of Israel. The Jewish people's historical claims to a small area of land bordering the eastern Mediterranean are not only the foundation of the modern state of Israel, they also lie in the very heart of, of Judeo-Christian belief. Yet, in the mythic past, Thomas Thompson argues that such claims are grounded in literary myth, not history. The mythic past provides refreshing new ways to read the Old Testament as the great literature it was meant to be and not as history. At the same time, its controversial conclusions about Jewish history are sure to prove incendiary in a worldwide debate about one of the world's most seminal texts and one of its most bitterly contested regions. Okay. So before I get into the book, let's further invalidate Judaism. Language as a system doesn't carry any meaning. It doesn't matter if I write down a bunch of stuff in the past and it survives for 2,000 years. I can't trust what that language says about my reality because I can't see anything connected to that set of words. Right? So when I sing, it's just a different kind of singing, a different kind of pattern. Your ears aren't picking up a language. You're not able to understand this stuff. So, so saying that this text is important is ludicrous. Literary analysis, is, as we'll see, shows it to be a storybook. Whatever. Um, I'm just too tired to fucking talk about it anymore. I'm living in a world full of people that are just fucking stupid. Okay. So, let's see. Okay, so, these are other books by Thomas L. Thompson. Published in 1999. To his children, we have a contents. How stories talk about the past, history and origins, the changing past, confusing stories with historical evidence, how the Bible talks about the past, Myths of origins. How historians create a past. You have beginnings. Mediterranean economy. Palestine's many people. Under the shadow of empires. Historians create history. And then the Bible's place in history. The Bible's social and historical worlds. The Bible's literary world. The Bible's Theological World, The Bible's Theological World Part 2, The Myths of the Sons of God, The Bible's Theological World Part 3, Israel is God's Son, and The Bible's Intellectual World. Okay. The Preface, The Academic Debate. At, at the moment of writing this preface, I am preparing to go to Luzane for a meeting of the European Seminar on Historical Methodology of the History of Israel. And reading the papers to be discussed at the seminar, the topic is the exile as a subject of history. The issues center on how we are to correlate the many Assyrian, Babylonian, and Persian texts relating to war, the destruction of cities, and deportation of peoples throughout the, their empires. 
the growing archaeological evidence from Palestine, and the wide variety of biblical traditions that deal with themes of destruction, exile, and return, but rarely of a period of exile itself. Half of the papers produced for the seminar share much the perspective of this book. Each of them, in its own way, points out difficulties in reading the biblical narratives about deportation and return as if they were historical. They point to the lack of a story in the Bible which tells us of an Israel or a Judah in exile. While they express few doubts that an exile must have occurred, they question whether a history of this exile can be written. The other half of the papers disagree strongly and argue that a history of the exile is at least possible. No one, however, proposes that the Bible's traditions provide us with adequate evidence for the history. As I read through these papers, I cannot help thinking about the changes in our approach to the Bible and its relationship to archaeology that have come about over the past 25 years. Long past is the assumption that ancient history can be written by merely paraphrasing or correcting the stories of the Bible. It has rather become quite difficult to understand these stories as recounting events from their author's past. It would be ingenuous of me to pretend that this book on the subject is uncontroversial. For me, the debate began as early as the late 1960s and was first voiced in a doctoral thesis started in 1967 at the University of Tübingen and completed in 1971. My original thesis stemmed from the idea that if some of the narratives about the Hebrew patriarchs could in fact be dated historically to the second millennium BCE, as nearly all archaeologists and historians then believed, it should be able to distinguish the earliest of the biblical stories from the later expanded traditions. When I first began this work, I had been so convinced of the historicity of the tales about the patriarchs in Genesis that I unquestioningly accepted parallels that had been claimed with the late Bronze Age family contracts found in the excavations of the ancient town of Nuzi in northern Mesopotamia. It was therefore all the more upsetting when, in 1969, after more than two years of work, it became clear that family customs and property laws of ancient Nuzi were neither unique in ancient Near Eastern property laws, wait, in, in, in ancient Near Eastern law, nor implied by Genesis stories. Many of these contracts had been misread and misinterpreted. At least one contract had been mistranslated with the purpose of creating a parallel with the Bible. The entire claim of newsy parallels to the patriarchal customs had been a thinly veiled fabrication, a product of wish fulfillment. An entire social world had been created which had never existed. This led to a discussion of the larger question of history and the patriarchs generally. I went on to review the central arguments that had been used to create and support the patriarchal period. The single most important argument had been a very complex Amorite hypothesis, asserting a nomadic migration of West Semites out of the Arabian desert, which disrupted the established agricultural civilizations of the Fertile Crescent late in the, mid, late in the third millennium BCE and developed new settlements from southern Mesopotamia to the Egyptian Delta. This related nearly every important text from the third and second millennium to the Bible and to Palestine, whether from Ur, Babylon, Mari, Amara, Ugarit, Egypt, Phoenicia, or from Palestine itself. These arguments from for Amorite migrations and for the existence of a patriarchal period in the history of the ancient Near East also collapsed. They were often arbitrary and willful. Scholars had taken for granted what they set out to prove, what was presented as the assured result of decades of science and scholarship amounted to careless assertions. The dissertation was finished in late 1971. Reactions to it were strong. I found it impossible to get my PhD in Europe or to publish my book in the United States. As things worked out, the book was eventually published in Germany in 1974, and I was able to receive my degree from, the, from Temple University in Philadelphia in 1976. The arguments against the historicity of the patriarchal narratives were 
strongly confirmed by the independent publication in 1975 of the Canadian scholar John Van Setter's Abraham in History and Tradition. Van Setter's book took the argument even further by showing that the biblical stories themselves could not be seen as early, but must be dated sometime in the 6th century BCE or later. In 1977, John Hayes and John Maxwell Miller published Israelite and Jerusalem History, a large volume of essays written by a number of younger scholars in which current historical research on each successive biblical period was reviewed. It was now clear that a previous confidence in the view that the Bible was an historical document was collapsing. Widespread doubt was expressed about the historicity not only of the patriarchs of Genesis, but of the stories about Moses, Joshua, and the judges as well. These historians first felt confident in speaking of history when dealing with the period of Saul, David, and Solomon. While Van Cedar's late dating of the Pentateuch received strong support in Germany, and his work led to radical changes in our understanding of these early books of the Bible. The mid-70s also saw the publication of a number of new and innovative journals that have changed the direction of research across the entire field of biblical studies. The Dalheima Blatta, published from Heidelberg, was certainly the most radical and original. The Sheffield Journal for the Study of the Old Testament, however, publishing in English and providing an early forum for debate on a wide spectrum of controversial topics was by far the most influential. The launching of Semia by the Society of Biblical Literature supported the growing interest in the United States in reading the Bible with techniques developed in literary criticism. Research on the Old Testament entered a generation-long period of transition marked by rapid change and innovation. Up through 1975, I continued my research on Bronze Age agriculture and the settlement history of both the Sinai and Palestine. In two books and a series of maps from the Tumbagin Atlas, Tumbagin Atlas of the Near East, I related archaeological and geological and, and ecological data in an effort to develop histories of the settlement and use of Palestine's many regions. I employed a history of agriculture and technology, settlement patterns and change, and climatic conditions as a basis for understanding long-term change in each region. This work was based largely on archaeological surveys that had been carried out by such Israeli scholars as Benno Rothenberg, Johan Aharoni, and Moshe Kokavi. I don't know how to pronounce these names. Supplemented by the archives of the Israeli and Jordanian Departments of Antiquities. While my research on this atlas project was one of the earliest attempts to develop a regional history of agriculture for Palestine, it lacked the consistency of a, uh, of a systematically collected... It lasted the... It lacked the consistency of systematically collected data that has been developed by the Survey of Israel and by most archaeological surveys carried out since the early 70s. In 1975, I left Germany and returned to the States. The controversies over my book on the patriarch shut me out of university teaching. I became a full-time house painter and handyman. My weekends and evenings were given to the study of Old Testament narrative and the Pentateuch. After nearly a decade of such isolation, my exclusion from the field reached an unexpected end. I was appointed by the Catholic Biblical Association as annual professor to the École Biblique in Jerusalem for 1985. The, the climate of biblical scholarship had shifted. Sociology and anthropology had grown among had grown strong in historical studies. Palestinian archaeologists had become increasingly frustrated with the biblical framework for their work. The literary nature of the Bible had become the central focus of biblical studies, and the history of religions had come to compete with theology as a dominant context for the study of the Bible. My understanding of the patriarchal narratives was no longer controversial. It had become part of the mainstream of the field. My trip to Jerusalem was to last nearly a year, during which I finished the first volume of my study of the Pentateuch and did some preliminary work with one of my colleagues at the École in Historical Geography. We eventually published this as a project proposal on regional histories with the title Toponomic Palestine. 
After returning for a brief period to house painting, I was awarded a National Endowment Fellowship for 1987, which allowed me to begin a project of the history of Israel's origins. This return to full-time research led to teaching appointments at Lawrence and Marquette Universities in Wisconsin. Much had changed in both history and archaeology by the late 1980s. In the development of my own re-education, two books were overwhelmingly important. The Social Anthrop Anthropological Study from 1985, Early Israel, by a Danish scholar who was to become my colleague and close collaborator, Niels Peter Lemk Lemke, and the, and the Comprehensive Synthesis of Archaeological Surveys of the Palestinian Highlands from 1988 by the Israeli archaeologist uh, Israel Finkelstein. The Archaeology of the, Is of the Israelite Settlement. Okay. Both Lemke's and Finkelstein's research confirmed the basic analysis of settlement patterns and interpretation of social structures, which had been central to my earlier studies of the Bronze Age. These two works have to be very these two works convinced me that a history of the region was possible though it would have to be a very different history than we have grown used to rather than attempting to write paraphrases of biblical narratives of unknown historical value we had the chance to develop an independent historical perspective of the past in 1987 i began to work on the question of israel's origins in an effort to show that such a history was possible in doing so, I retraced a line of argument I had originally set out in, in an article in 1978 under the title, The Background of the Patriarchs, How, now republished in a book edited by John Rogerson. This article had located the origins of an historical Israel in the growth of centralization of the highlands of, of, in, the, in the highlands north of Jerusalem during the 9th century BCE. This implicitly excluded any trans-regional political unity embracing most of Palestine. That is, there could not have been a united monarchy with a Saul, David, or Solomon in Jerusalem under the title, The Early History of the Israelite People. Reactions to this book were stronger even than those, even, were stronger even than those to my book on the patriarchs had been. Although the historical nature of the David stories had been doubted since the 1970s by literary scholars, and even though the Italian uh, Semitist Giovanni Garbini had already questioned the historicity of, of the United Monarchy in 1986, my finding, my finding no place for David or his empire in my history of Israel created a scandal. A review of my book appeared on the front page of the London newspaper, The Independent, on Sunday. I was coming up for tenure at Marquis University, where officials were already very, un very unhappy over my research. Publicity stirred up conservative theological dogma, and my work was found incompatible with the Catholic mission of the university. While this breach of academic freedom could have led to personal disaster, it proved to be an unequivocal blessing. I was called to take up a chair in Old Testament and in Old Testament at the University of Copenhagen, where I have been now since 1993. Since 1992, and fueled by the publication of Philip Davies *In Search of Ancient Israel*, a broad debate had raged on the history of Israel and Palestine. The debate had been heated, but it has also been open, and and the field as a whole is engaged in it, as the coming meeting at at, at in Lawrence witnesses. The long preoccupation of biblical studies with, with the question of origins has led to many dis, distortions in the understanding of the tradition. Today, we no longer have a history of Israel. Not only have Adam and Eve and the flood story passed over to mythology, but we can no longer talk about a time of the patriarchs. There never was a united monarchy in history, and it is meaningless to speak of pre-exilic prophets and their writings. The history of Iron Age Palestine today knows of Israel only as a small highland patronate lying north of Jerusalem and south of the Jezreel Valley. Nor has Yahweh, the deity dominant in the cult of, the Isra of, of, of that Israel's people, much to do with the Bible's understanding of God. Any history rewrite of this people will hardly resemble the Israel we thought we knew so much about only a few years ago. And 
even the little and even that little will hardly open to us the Bible's origins in history. Our history of biblical tradition has come topsy-turvy. It is only a Hellenistic Bible that we know, namely the one that we first begin to read in the text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls near Qumran. I have argued that the quest for origins is not an historical quest, but a theological and literary question, a question about meaning. To give it a historical form is to attribute it to our own search for meaning. Biblical scholarship used to believe that we might understand the Bible if we could only get back to its origins. The question about origins, however, is not an answerable one. Not only is the Bible's Israel a literary fiction, but the Bible begins as a tradition already established, a stream of stories swung song uh, a stream of stories song and philosophical reflections collected discussed and debated our sources do not begin they lie already in media threads uh, we can say now with considerable confidence that the bible is not a history of anyone's past the story of the chosen and rejected israel that is present is a philosophical metaphor of a mankind that has lost its way the tradition itself is a discourse about reorganizing that way. In our historicizing of this tradition, we have lost sight of the Bible's intellectual center as well as of our, our own. The question of origins, which has dominated modern research into the Bible, belongs to theology rather than to history. It asks after the meaning of the Bible in its beginnings. In this, it shares the same Hellenistic quest that was also the Bible's, to trace our tradition of ourselves and God back to the creation. Ever since the opening of the controversies over the early history book, I have been encouraged to, pre to present my work on the Bible in its relationship to historical research in a comprehensive way. In particular, the support and ever generous help of the archaeological journalist David Keyes and my literary agent William Hamilton and my editor at Jonathan Cape, Jorg Hensgen, have been indispensable. This encouragement led me to write this present work in the way I have. Part 1 discusses the literary qualities of biblical stories and traditions, and takes up the implicit argument that the Bible hardly intends to be read as if it were a history book. Part 2 is based on my 1992 book and takes up many of the themes of my earlier work on the patriarchs and my studies in historical geography. Since I moved to Copenhagen, I have become more involved in the theological and intellectual significance of biblical texts. This, together with an interest in literary studies, gives the historical work a context it otherwise would lack. Part 3 attempts to structure this context that the Bible's authors were part of. The first half of the research that I had published in 1992 presents my view of the history of scholarship on ancient Israel. There is no need to repeat any of that here. There are a number of works, however, which like those of Van Cedars, Lemke, and Finkelstein, have influenced me a great deal. There are also many which I believe might be helpful to any who would wish to read further following list of works is offered with the hope of encouraging such reading. Recommended reading. Okay, that's the intro. And I know what the origin was, the solar flares from 13,000 years ago. I've made videos about it. We can talk about it later. <laughs>